Greetings watch lovers and welcome to Watches in the Wild. Today's watch makes no sense whatsoever. Some might consider it to be a complete failure, an anachronistic oddity with a very confused sense of identity. And to be honest, I kind of agree with that assessment, but I somehow have no choice but to love it. Let me explain to you why. We are, of course, talking about the Rolex Milgaus, arguably one of the most obscure references in the Crown's professional line, which includes such all-stars as the Daytona Submariner or GMT Master. To review this watch, I've chosen to travel to Geneva, Switzerland, where the Rolex headquarters are located and where this legendary luxury brand manufactures its cases and dials. It is also where the Milgaus' main competency, resisting strong magnetic fields, underwent its first test. On the outskirts of Geneva you find CERN, the European Organization for Nuclear Research. As you may know, in 1989 this place birthed the World Wide Web and did so almost by accident, looking for a better way to share information between scientists. Moreover, CERN houses some of the world's strongest magnets. They are aimed at accelerating and concentrating particle beams, which, in a 27-kilometer-long loop beneath the border of France and Switzerland, are made to collide with each other. The collisions leftovers are then analyzed in the hope of catching a glimpse of even smaller and more fundamental particles, nature's innermost secrets. Just a bit more history. Introduced in 1956, the Milgaus was actually tested by people at CERN. Even though none of the huge magnets you find there today were in use back then. Nevertheless, the Milgaus mission was to protect its movement against those invisible fields emanating not just from the ginormous magnets of the Large Hadron Collider, but from computers and other electronic devices everywhere. To cut the history part short, few people wanted the watch and Rolex saw it fit to discontinue the line altogether after having literally given them as a freebie to people who purchased other models. If you look at the rather nondescript or let's just say boring design of this piece, the Milgaus reference 1019, you might begin to understand why people weren't falling over each other to get one. When the Milgaus was brought back to life in 2007, after a hiatus of nearly two decades, it was welcomed by enthusiasts in the beginning, but subsequently not nearly as sought after as the brand's usual suspects. This brings us to the present day and to this watch. Introduced in 2014, the Milgaus Z Blue is the most current iteration of this magnetism-defeating model line. As I have alluded to in the beginning, the Milgaus makes very little sense, starting with its main purpose, anti-magnetism. Needless to say, your movement being protected against magnetism is a good thing. Magnetism can cause parts in the balance spring to stick together and make the watch go crazy fast or almost bring it to a standstill. However, many watches nowadays have exchanged the metal in essential running parts with other materials either being resistant to magnetism or completely amagnetic. Rolex, for instance, employs a balance spring made in part of niobium, a material which is highly anti-magnetic. Besides its so-called parachrome blue balance spring, used in many of its offerings for men, Geneva's giant also uses a so-called siloxy balance spring in women's watches, which, using silicon, is effectively impervious to the effects of magnetic fields. The question then becomes, why have an anti-magnetic watch in your lineup when most of your watches provide good protection against magnetism already, granted that parts other than the balance spring could still get magnetized? One cannot shake the feeling that the Milgaus is a bit anachronistic or even outdated in this regard, especially when it comes to its first line of defense against the invisible enemy. It uses a soft iron cage enclosing the movement, a cage in the case to bend magnetic fields around it. This seems to be an inelegant solution, especially given the existence of modern Omega watches. Many of those achieve an extremely high degree of anti-magnetism by simply using innovative materials in their movements, making an extra cage, in addition to the outer case, redundant. 
The movement of the Milgauss, namely its balance ring, escape wheel and lever, are made of anti-magnetic materials as well. But in order to achieve that 1000 Gauss, it needs that inner iron cage, which adds quite a bit of bulk to the watch. You will notice a marked difference if you compare it to a Datejust or even to a Rolex Submariner. It remains quite wearable, but I wouldn't have refused a more swelled package. More importantly, I don't think that added bit of protection justifies the extra thickness for most people. For one, it makes the watch more heavy. For two, it's sitting high on the wrist makes that knock against the door or the collision with the refrigerator all the more likely. In short, the Milgauss might be good at keeping in check magnetic fields, but at the price of becoming a magnet itself, one that will attract more than a few scratches. The watch being scratch prone is further helped by the high polish on the bezel, all around the case and the polished center links and clasp. Let me address one more gripe before I move on to why I, nevertheless, am in love with this watch. That is the identity of the Milgauss, or rather the identity crisis it seems to have. As I said, the Milgauss is part of the professional line and marketed as a scientist's watch. One would thus expect it to be a practical watch as well, one that excels in a work environment. However, the omnipresent high polish I mentioned suggests otherwise and gives it more of a dressy vibe. The new Milgauss is in stark contrast to the old variants, which all featured bezels and a more everyday friendly brushed polish. Thus, some might say the modern version veered too far from its decidedly practical roots. So, is it a dress watch then? Well, just looking at the dial, it isn't really that either. Pairing the colors green, orange and blue with a suit would be a challenge, to say the least. Maybe, just maybe, you could pull it off, but my fear is that you would look more like a clown than an actual gentleman, even though my fashion-forward girlfriend is disagreeing with me here, admittedly. And then there is, of course, that orange bold second hand and that green-tinted crystal, both look extravagant, avant-garde and a bit too playful for a formal situation. Would you really wear this one for a job interview? Maybe if you are applying for a job at MoMA, but otherwise probably not. The Milgauss then is a curious in-between, an alien in both the dress and the tool watch world. It is everything but an obvious choice, especially if you want to fit one of these two traditional categories. Now I've given you a litany of complaints. You might ask yourself, why am I wasting my time reviewing this watch? Well, it turns out some of these points, if viewed from another angle, are actually positives. Take the identity crisis I just mentioned. The Milgauss being outclassed by many of Rolex's own alternatives, for instance, the Datejust or the Submariner. But why, you might ask, can't the watch just be its own thing, especially in a time when all sorts of categories seem to be in flux anyways, when it's apparently possible, as my girlfriend has told me, to wear sneakers with a traditional suit? Maybe the Milgauss is just the horological equivalent of wearing sneakers together with a suit, although I have to say I much prefer the design of the Milgauss to that sartorial combination. And I actually love the fact that it isn't an obvious choice, but rather special. A blue, orange and green iceberg in an ocean of Submariners, GMTs and Daytonas. Speaking about those colors, which shouldn't go together, but somehow do. Take a look again at that dial. It's hard to pair with anything, but it's also just awesome coming from one of the most conservative watch brands out there, known for their slow incremental changes and their risk-averse attitude. It's like Rolex is behaving out of character with this watch, a bit like seeing your suit-loving grandpa show up with jeans and a pink t-shirt for Christmas dinner. It's not very representative of the guy, but it sure is interesting. And talking about the Milgauss roots and the modern iterations being too different from the first ones, 
I think the considerable design gap is actually a strength of the new models. Personally, I happen to be rather bored by vintage reissues, watches which copy-pasted a design from the past, maybe adding 3 millimeters of diameter to the case size and upgrading some of the internals. To me, that's uninspired and a sad reflection of our zeitgeist, which only seems to want to turn to the past because it is afraid of the future. But that's for another video. Suffice it to say, the Milgaus isn't that. It takes the coolest element of the original, the lightning bolt seconds hand, and makes some original new design choices to accommodate that quirky feature. The Sea Blue came out in 2014, but it looks way more modern than many watches we are presented with nowadays. And lastly, even when it comes to its stated anti-magnetism feature, that bulk adding soft iron cage, I kind of like it. I like the concrete, palpable nature of it. As a non-material scientist, I have a hard time picturing the amagnetic elements of an advanced Omega movement. However, I can picture that soft iron cage of the Milgaus. It's more relatable, it's physically there, literally in the form of a shield or a shell or an armor protecting the watch. Which makes me like it emotionally, even though rationally there are better and more elegant ways to achieve that same effect. And in the end, watch collecting is all about emotions and much less about a spec sheet. Omega doesn't quite get that when it merely tries to up the 1000 Gauss of the Milgauss and offers 15,000 Gauss of anti-magnetic resistance on some of their watches. Now, are there some things I would improve? Yes, I'd like for the minutes and hour hands to be broader. To my eye, at least, they seem ever so slightly out of proportion when compared to the hour indices and the rest of the dial. Also, as a direct consequence, that little stripe of superluminova isn't easy to read in low light conditions. For all of us non-eagles, at least, and that green tinted crystal, it would be nice if the halo it creates around the dial was more pronounced when looking at it directly from above. Rolex actually seems to agree with me about this, as their own website shows a thick green ring around the dial. I'd love to have it just like that. In reality, though, it is barely noticeable and only becomes prominent when you turn the watch and look at it from an angle. But of course, that's not how you usually admire your watch. Lastly, it's hard to explain why it costs nearly 2,000 Swiss francs more than the Air King, which shares its movement case proportions and even the soft iron case with the Milgaus. To conclude, the Milgaus is a curious watch. It doesn't make sense on so many levels, and yet its irrational nature is exactly what makes it original, lovable, and perhaps the most unique and surprising expression of the Rolex watchmaking spirit. It may not be the first, second, or third choice. It may not be what people think of when they think of Rolex. But that, to me, is actually kind of a good thing. And now it's time to thank you for watching. Let me remind you, as I probably should do more often and more aggressively, to subscribe if you enjoyed my content. Your support really means a lot to me and motivates me to make more videos. Thank you and see you again soon.